How do you stand out in a crowded market and grow your business as a creator? If you want to sell something, this could be a newsletter, this could be a paid product. You have to talk about this shit. Like you have to talk about it all the time because if you don't do it, people just scroll through their feed. They don't see your stuff. The algorithm will like hide your stuff from some people. So the more you post, the more results you get also for plugs. Like it will piss off some people, but I think like the long game, you have to find a balance, right? You can't spam without giving actual value, but you also cannot expect people to understand where they have to go if you don't talk about it enough. Ola Lehman is the founder of AI Solopreneur. He grew from zero to 100,000 followers on Twitter in just 65 days and built a six-figure business in the space of four months. In today's episode of Creators on Air, Ola shares his growth strategies, how he successfully launched digital products and how he plans to continue growing. I mean, I think it has to do with some parts of my story. So last year was really shitty for me, to be honest. Um, um, there was this big like crypto scam called FTX, was a crypto exchange, crypto broker, and uh, it went bankrupt. And with this bankruptcy, it took uh, like most of my money, which was nice. <laughs> so um, I was in crypto before for a couple of years and it, I don't know, I feel like it was kind of destiny maybe um just life yeah had me choose like what to do next basically and uh, at around the same time i just saw chat gpt for the first time and just had the feeling man I just i just want to create something new and uh, instead of doing something that's like based on speculation as crypto is um i really want to do it like something that's more valuable to people and teach some new stuff and for me it's always the best way to learn something is to really um teach it to someone else and to keep myself accountable so that's why i decided okay i um, really like this ai stuff and um i have also been a solopreneur for basically all of my life and it was just a kind of a stacking of two topics that i was really interested in and i could also relate to right so there was some kind of planning in, in, in terms of oh i know solopreneurship is kind of a hot topic because i mean guys like justin welch really made it big on twitter but it was also okay how can i connect something that's that I'm interested in, I'm like really curious about with something that connects with who I am. And that's like how the AI solopreneur came about. I love that. And I feel like you grew really, really rapidly, both with your newsletter and your social media platform. So if I'm not mistaken, you grew from zero to 100K on Twitter in like 65 days. Yeah. What do you think contributed to that rapid growth? I think there, there is not one thing. I think it was a combination of maybe... I think three factors are really important. So the first of them, of them was really the positioning, because as I said, most of the people were just focused on this. These are the AI news. The everyone was doing the same shit, and they're mostly like personal accounts. And so I really like already niched down my positioning just talking to solopreneurs, which feels like it makes the audience smaller. But there's so many people who are interested in solopreneurship. So I guess the positioning was very on point, and. Not right now, I'm not the only AI solopreneur anymore, but I really am <laughs> the like, category um, starter, I would say. Yeah. Um, so that helped a lot to be very specific about the audience that I serve and also the audience that I don't serve and the kind of content I don't do. So the positioning was very important. Then it was really high volume. So I've done six Twitter threads for, this, for the beginning time each week and tweets. So it was high, high, high volume. Um, and also really just focusing on growth threads. People always laugh about oh, the thread guys or the thread boys or whatever, <laughs> but it just worked. I still think it works. And yeah, it is all about seeing what works and doing like a shitload more of the same thing. So that was my main approach to the content. And the third one is obviously I was just riding a wave. And this is not like something I made, like I didn't create the AI hype, but it was just huge demand demand for the topic. Like uh, ChatGPT was going crazy. Um, all the uses of AI went crazy. And I think that's so important to understand when there's demand and when there's no demand. Um, so just like riding this wave really helped me. And um, I'm still growing like at a nice speed, but this growth in April and May, uh, it was insane. Like, yeah. Just crazy. It sounds crazy. And I want to jump back into the threads because I mean, six threads a week is a lot. Um, so I'm guessing that you've got a lot of insight into what makes a good thread so like how do you approach threads to make them yeah you know really speak to people i think first of all you have to be aware of trends so because there's always like there are always like these kind of trendy hooks and everyone uses the same one yeah. honestly i think i created at least two or three of the ai hook templates that everyone used after this um so it's really finding a 
a good hook. Like for, for threads, it's always about finding a strong and good hook. Sometimes what also even works is using a hook that, I'm, I hate to say it, but like that some people just really hate. Oh, really? Then would answer. So you do something like, uh, when it's about like logo creation, you just like, rest in peace designers, question mark. And everyone who comes like, no, this one, this, <laughs> this logo is shit. And it just boosts up your engagement. So that's uh, wow. definitely also a tactic to think about um, because it drives a lot of engagement. This is not my... This is not my core strategy, but this yeah. is something to keep in mind. Like, it's really about, and and I think this is really why AI threads popped off so hard because so many people also complained about it because it's also like a, it's the shift, like a a big shift in the in society that some people don't like to see. So you always have people like, oh, we don't need that. That's all shit. No, uh, it will never um, be a replacement for a real person, right? You always have because it's such a it's like a seismic shift, yeah, right. Um, and I think like leaning into into those topics is really good because it will always drive a lot of traffic for you. Mm. Yeah. And did you find any challenges come about by growing so rapidly? Challenges for sure is that you get bombarded by inbound DMs. Like it's so hard to keep up. It's crazy. Like, and also sometimes there will be like really good opportunities coming up your way. But if you get, I don't know, 30 or 40 messages every day or even more, it's very hard to go through them and also understand, is this something that really interests me or is it like a, it's like something valuable to me or is this like someone spamming me? Because, and also um, the faster you grow, the more like weird trolls and like really, you can always tell if a thread really goes viral when you start to get a lot of hate, no matter what you do. That's like the, the sad reality of it. So I think like dealing with people, like just being really bad on online to you <laughs> that's yeah. like that's a hard reality you have to deal if you ha if you want to grow fast it's going to come with a lot of shit you have to face from people that's just just the truth um and yeah it's also it's i mean like creating content and growing it's really hard on your dopamine system because you you're just used to like oh this day i grow five thousand followers next day you grow like 1k followers and you're like Ugh, like what is shit day wow. that's, that's ridiculous <laughs> right it's yeah. so hard to get from and also like it also, but also hard for me before. So like, it's just crazy because you get used to it so fast. And at one point I saw another AI creator and I grew like to a hundred K and he grew to like 160. I was like, Oh, what am I doing wrong? Is this is not working. Wow. And if you think about it, it's, but it's all like in relation. So you really, yeah. you really have to be very aware of your own psychology when it comes to growth. Mm. Um, because I changed the psychology to, I don't want to focus on the like pure growth number, but really like about the value I create. And also about the relationships I build with my audience, but also with other creators. And once that changed, it was a big kind of relief for me um, because like being focused on growth is a losing game. You cannot win eternal growth. It's mm. it just like it's physically not possible or technically. Yeah, definitely. And I'm interested how you kind of keep up to date with everything because AI is like constantly evolving. There's always new tools. There's always new things going on. And you seem to be creating content in quite a big volume as well so how are you making sure you keep up to the pace of creating content that's actually like up to date and relevant it's hard <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah so i think it's important to have systems in place in terms of um because content usually gives you a signal what people want and what they don't want and so listening to this is already a great help in terms of to decide let's say i, I put out five threads right and one of them completely flops uh, one of them gets a lot of traction and Another one, the, the other one are like in the middle. So I, I'd have a look at both of the the bad end and the good end to see, okay, why did, didn't that one work and why did the other one work? And maybe I can create a slightly different angle of the one that worked. Or I see a thread by someone else and be like, okay, how can I twist this? So really building these systems to make content creation easier for you so you don't start at zero. That's really important. Um, I also think like AI can be a good help to just help you create some stuff faster. Um, but yeah, then again, it's just, it's, it's a game of reps. Right? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, it's going to be hard. So for anyone listening, if you just started your creator journey and hear someone, oh, it's so just create six threads, it's hard. <laughs> and it's, it's, it gets way easier the longer you do it. Um, because you just, you just get the hang of it somehow. Um, so I think it's the most important part is like just to get started and stay consistent because consistency is really where most people fall off because it's demanding. It's yeah. like a 24 seven job. Definitely. And what about engagement? Because you've mentioned that a lot of 
you know other AI creators were creating under like you know their own personal accounts and you've kind of gone on the approach of being like AI solopreneur but how do you still maintain make sure that you're maintaining relationships with your audience when it's not yeah. under a personal brand um I actually also run my personal brand now as like I I think now it's like a cool winning combo of having the personal account that's also not only AI based, but it's also like I'm sharing very personal stuff and I share stuff about building the actual business. And I think that combination has really helped me also to sell a lot of products because the trust is just built differently. Um, but in terms of engagement with my audience, um, I think most of the trust I build is built in my newsletter and not on Twitter. So I see Twitter more as of a, of a like top of funnel thing. And I would be lying if I told you, oh, I'm I'm going to answer every comment. I'm not. Like, I, I I don't have the time to comment. Like, I try to. Um, I also try to. On, I'm just going to be open. I also try, like, getting a VA to respond to comments. But then it's like, ah, it doesn't sound. It, it's so off. And I, I feel like people can sense it, right? Um, so I'm like, I'd rather share stuff that's interesting for people. And, like, if they get deeper into my funnel, they get more of me, kind of. So let's say they start on Twitter. Maybe they won't. No, not everyone will get a, a comment back. But if they are interested, they will go into the newsletter. They, I would share some more personal stuff. Then maybe they buy my product, and they also get more to see more of me, or they follow my personal profile. So it's more of a, it's more of a world kind of, not only like a single experience through like this kind of faceless entity. And how do you make sure that funnel actually works? So, for example, how are you driving people from Twitter to your newsletter? Do you have to? plug it every so often yeah. or is it naturally <laughs> happening <laughs> you plug it all the time that's also <laughs> what i learned about because it's like also getting people into your newsletter is also selling right it's for free yeah. but you're selling you're selling a product you're selling a free product basically so the sell is not as hard but i think most people go wrong that they don't sell enough in terms of they maybe they have a product and they just potentially they would send like one email oh the product is out and what i really understood in the last month is like if you want to sell something, this could be a newsletter, this could be a paid product. You have to talk about this shit. Like you have to talk about it all the time, because if you don't do it, like people just scroll through their feed, they don't see your stuff. Like it's the algorithm will like hide your stuff from some people. So the more you will post, the more results you get. Also for plugs, like it will piss off some people, but I think like the long game, it's you have to find a balance, right? You can't spam without giving actual value. But you also cannot expect people to understand where they have to go if you don't talk about it enough. And have you found ways of, I guess, communicating in a, in a way that, you know, you're still selling, but it's maybe more effective and it's not coming across as salesy? Yeah, for sure. So I think like really sharing results of your audience is the best hack you can do. Like there's, there's no easier sell in terms of look at what this guy just, he just made money with doing my techniques or... Uh, Another person saved a lot of time for their content creation and they, they just shared it openly without me asking. That's always great. For me, it also helps a lot to share my personal story. For example, I had one post on my personal that was like, uh, I think it was like four months ago, I made my first dollar selling a digital product on Gumroad, which was actually true. And I attached like a screenshot of my old tweet from March when I was like, oh my God, I made, I made $9 on Gumroad. Amazing. And then I said, okay, now I made 170K. It's wow. cringe, but those men must work. That's why we do it. Yeah. Now I made this amount selling this course. Without content creation, I would be nowhere. Um, if you're interested in the course, here's the link. So you com connect it to like a personal story, to an outcome that people want, to a reference point of, oh, I've been there too. And I'm not bullshitting you. I've, I've been at the, like You can publicly see me posting that I've been where you are right now only five months ago. And this really motivates people. Like, oh, they are, oh my God, I want that product. So yeah. that works really well, for example. I love that. I love how you've been able to use yourself as, a, as an example to people and actually show those results. Um, so let's talk about how you are monetized as a creator. What are your current revenue streams? Like what makes up the business? Yeah, so my main revenue stream is my digital product sales. I only have one product right now. And um, I launched it for the first time on the 1st of August. So right now, it's yeah, one month ago, 30 years ago, the first time. So I chose like a drop kind of model, like open it for four days, then open it for 48 hours again. I will reopen it again, but then keep it open. That's my main revenue driver. And so this is like driving, I don't know, 95% of my revenue, something like that, 90. So um, this is my main revenue driver at the moment. I've, which 
I think the last month they made 170 gross, 175 and netted, I think 155. Um, but I also had some cost, blah, 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 but around that number. So it was amazing for me, completely blew my mind, to be honest. <laughs> so I'm not going <laughs> to lie about that. Um, then I'm also doing sponsorships on my newsletter. So I'm selling ad spots, uh, which is around 2K a month, which is not huge, but it's like a, a nice uh, little revenue stream you also have. Uh, not, little in compared, I'm not saying that's little money, little in compared to what my products bring me in. Um, I think it's important to say 2K is still a lot of money um, yeah. from, to get from someone to pay you to write. Um, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I also done some Twitter sponsorships, but I'm, I've, I've done it more in the beginning when I didn't have any product. And honestly, I really want to move away from anything that's like ad related because I think like you're, it really changes the way you look at your readers and customers because if you're selling ad spots, for example, you look at them like, what do I want from you? I want you to click my ad, right? That's mm. what I need f for me to get paid. And I don't like that. But if you have your own product, it's like, I want you to buy my product that will give you value and make you better at something and it will deepen our relationship. That's like such a bigger win for me. So I, I, I realized that this is the way for me going forward. I will also start a paid newsletter this is the official first announcement. Uh, it's not out yet oh, in nice. the public. Maybe if the, when this podcast comes out, it's already live. Yeah. So planning to launch this uh, end of September. Um, so I will add like a paid tier to my newsletter, like a monthly reoccurring fee and get rid of the ads on this newsletter. And this is something I'm actually super excited about because I've, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but it feels like fun to do it, to go more in depth, do like a 20 bucks a month subscription. And like if my math checks out, Sometimes it doesn't, but in my head, I'm like, I have 21,000 subscribers. So I think when I launched, I have probably around 23, maybe 24, if it goes, uh, goes right. And if I convert like 2%, that's already 450 people. And if I charge them 20 bucks a month, that's like almost 10K a month wow. of subscription revenue. That's good. So maths. I think that's, that's a decent, yeah, that's, this was still like, I, I pretended to know the exact number, but around 10K. <laughs> <I think>. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, this is like a cool reoccurring revenue stream because if you do, um, like course launches, it's always like these big events, right? And then it's like n nothing basically. Um, so my plan is to keep the course open. I'm also uh, writing an e education email course right now. So just to summarize, I'll have the education email course, a five day for free email course that will sell you on the course. And if someone goes into the course for free, maybe some people will buy this will bring in some sales over time. Then I also plug the newsletter, uh, the product in my newsletter at the bottom, like Justin Welch does. So like also every week, twice a week, so people would see it. I'll add the paid newsletter subscription model, which hopefully will bring in around eight to 10 K a month. And I'm also doing some consulting, but I don't, it's not that I don't like it, but it's, I don't like if someone can tell me when to work, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, I just really don't like it. So yeah. every time I have the calls, I really enjoy the calls, and I think it's it's also really <laughs> nice to to. But honestly, I'd rather get on the call with someone just for chatting with them than charging them and being like, oh, now now I have to deliver, and also now I have to be there because you booked my time. So I feel like I'd rather do it for free, and they help me with something than like, oh, here's my consulting booking link. I don't know, yeah. I don't like it that much. Yeah. No, I, I like how um, diversified all of that is and how you're also planning ahead. Um, so I feel like there's a lot to dig in there. Let's start with the digital product. How did you decide what was the right digital product for your audience? I've done a lot of research. So um, if you want to launch a digital product, it's don't underestimate like how many people you should talk to. Most people, I think, talk to like maybe five. And I believe you should talk to like 40 or 50 and also maybe get type forms in just asking about like, what are people struggling with? How do they talk about their problems? What is like, what did they spend money, money on before? Which kind of products? What did they miss in those products? So all these like kind of classic market research questions, they helped me a lot to find something. Um, I think if I would, if I had more time until launch, I would have done like a beta sale to see are actually sales coming in. Because I think if you do this, it's even better to validate, but I skipped this. Um, and I just opened a wait list, but I also saw like the wait list, like it filled up so fast. And then I was like, okay, there is, I'm not, I wasn't sure if I, if I would sell like 20 K 
I thought, okay, if it if it goes really well, I'm going to sell like 40 or 50k. I was like, okay, 50k would be crazy. Um, but yeah, then uh, once you've launched a product, it's so much easier, right? Because then you know there's product market fit and you can build around that product. But for the first one, it's really about listening to people without like projecting your own ideas about what they need on them. Mm. That's what most people, I think, get wrong about this. So did you jump onto calls with yeah. members of your audience? And Yes, a yeah. lot of them. Oh, okay. I offer them I offer them like a, a 10 or 15 minute free consulting. Oh um, wow, okay. As an incentive and I opened I think like <laughs> 20 spots on one day and because I messed it up the Calendly, I somehow always mess up the Calendly. I hate it. I hate <laughs> it so. And then next day I had like 20 bookings on one day. I was like, Fuck, "Oh wow. I had to get on 20 calls in a row." Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's so intense. It was, that was kind of hard. I would never do this again like this, but <laughs> It already gave me a good idea. Also, I also asked a lot about like price point and what people would pay. And interestingly, I was more concerned about being too pricey uh, when I launched the product. But I just, this was like the only downside because after speaking to those people, I was super unclear about how, the, how much I wanted to pay. So I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to go more for the lower end of what I think. And I think I could have gone way higher with the price. Um, but it's, it's okay for me because... I also rather like over deliver on the first product and just build the like goodwill and trust and earn less. It's okay. Like I'm not here like to maximize every dollar, but that was interesting. Like it's pricing is one of the hard things to understand in research for me. Mm, definitely. I think that's a difficult thing for most people, whether it's products or sponsorships or anything. Is there anything that you learned from that launch that you're going to take with you for future launches? All the stuff that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> that's for sure so especially on my second launch like a uh, thrive card my main like a uh, checkout uh, where people can purchase after they clicked on the landing page it just went down they had like server issues when i just launched my course at my peak time and oh nothing my gosh. worked and i was like fuck i should have prepared a second checkout just like to swap the links and have one that's running so that's something i definitely learned like if you have one solution that works you don't have you have none <laughs> because if it goes down you're fucked so that was the first one for me. Then like don't never trust PayPal. Like PayPal froze 35k uh, euros and I don't know when I can get them. Just out of nowhere for no reason. That's another thing I learned. Uh, never use PayPal. They suck and they will just take your money and tell you <laughs> you're going you're gonna to get it in 180 days. Um, yeah, so th these things is more on the like fuck up side. But also I learned a lot about if you have a product that people want, you can do whatever the fuck you want. I think that's very important to understand. Like if you get the product part right, you can mess up basically everything else because people will still want to buy your product. If you have a product that has like decent demand, if you start up, start to do like little things wrong, maybe they will fall off. Ah, I don't need it anyway. But I think my main takeaway was I really tried to create a product that people want and that really talk to their needs. And if you get this right, it's it's not hard to sell it because people will like they are in your DMs like I want it uh, I will pay you more if you open the shop again one again I was like but that's that's crazy to think about but yeah that was one of my major takeaways for me um, never think that you understand what someone wants until they really tell you what they want and then sometimes they tell you what they want but what they actually need is again something <laughs> but yeah. Uh, Understanding the psychology of people who want to, who might purchase your product is the most important part in my eyes. Yeah, no, that's a good lesson to learn from. And I think it's amazing that you had such a successful launch, but there's still things to take away and learn from. Um, I want to talk about sponsorships as well. I know you said that you don't want to place as much of an emphasis on it, but I think 2K consistently is like really good. And a lot of our listeners obviously do quite a lot of sponsorships, but might not yeah. have as consistent of an income with it so how do you keep it so consistent where you're kind of making the same amount each month like how are you filling up these spots um the honest answer is i get an inbound <laughs> so people <laughs> i think i'm in a niche that's pretty popular and also it's i think like really showing people that you deliver on what you say like it also with the product i think selling the product also helps me on ad sales because people see all this He's telling you, I'm going to launch a product. He's, he's doing it. He's delivering value. Like on every different channel, I'm delivering you what I tell you or more. And I think that's important for partners to see that you're not like one of these like half-assing everything. And also showing that my audience is an audience that will buy. 
that's also very helpful. So if I think if you have any chances of showing that people in your audience um, have money, are willing to spend money and trust you with that money, that's great for you for sponsors because it really improves your leverage to them because they're like, my audience paid me, I don't know, 100K last month. I'm pretty sure they will also, they, are, they could also potentially be customers of yours. Um, so that's also very helpful, I think, to yeah, just uh, try to do what you say yeah. and always keep yourself up to a high standard in product. Yeah, definitely. And um, how are you managing sponsorships alongside, you know, creating your own content, creating products and also like planning ahead as well? Like, I just feel like you're managing a lot of things. How are you doing? Yeah, it all? I'm doing way too much. Uh, <laughs> so I'm actually thinking about hiring someone who can do the, I, I, had, I had the lucky, lucky shot of someone bought like one and a half month of ads with me once um, or like one month while my product was launching and also while my product was launching, I also didn't have any ads, but yeah, it's a lot of work. So best, I think if you're into the ads model, it's really about finding some strong partners that you'll have like a long-term relationship with, because if you only have um, a lot of churn in terms of uh, like uh, every sponsor is like just one off, it's annoying. I also changed my offering to only offering at least four ad spots, like for two weeks. Because if you only have one ad spot and it's only one spot, you have to do the uh, outreach. You have to talk with them about the ad copy. You have to edit the ad copy. You have to do it. In the so there's so much work. And then it's like True. 200 bucks. Sometimes it's so much work. It's like it's not even worth it. Um, so like finding stronger partners that have like more of a long-term out outlook, I think that's very key for um, for running ads. That's a really good idea, actually. I like that. And how did you go about pricing ads like do you have set rates or do you negotiate with partners yeah so i honestly i just had a look at most of i knew and just kind of copied their cpm <laughs> model so i knew like my open rate i know my click rates and um i just i never charged a crazy high cpm just in the beginning I was like okay i want to get some revenue in from the new setter but yeah i think with ads the problem is it also i don't know it just gives me like some kind of anxiety you know uh oh my God, what if no one clicks the ad? Then it's like, it feels shitty. So if it's my own stuff, it's like, okay, then I don't sell anything. I don't. Yeah, like, true. And I try to make it better. But if it's like a third party that paid for the, I know it's not only my, it's not my fault if my audience doesn't buy it, right? But it's, I still feel bad somehow. If someone wants an ad and it gets like 90 clicks and like no one purchased, them, I'm like, oh shit, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I personally don't enjoy running ads as much but maybe i will again at a bigger size of the audience so that's also something to keep in mind right if you have like a 100k list the game feels different in terms of ads you should employ someone to run your ads and then it's just like another revenue stream you can create but for me personally i think going paid subscription on a newsletter plus building my own products is feels like a more like owned and yeah, for me, like a better way to monetize. And how are you going about building a paid newsletter? So like, what's your thought process been so far about, you know, like making sure that you're going to deliver on value and what that structure of the newsletter is going to be and how it will differ from your free newsletter. Yeah. Talk me through what's going on right now. So right now, the plan is that right now I'm sending two editions that have the same length and uh, I will change it that like the one on Saturday will be longer, around 50% longer but it will also add other elements. So it will, on the on, like the first part is, is longer, it's more in depth. It's more geared towards a very specific business problem. And it will also give you access to like a monthly masterclass. So it's more about, okay, you are serious about using AI for your business, but you will also get these extra experiences. So you pay more, but you have this like interactive element. Um, I might also add like some kind of discounted products. So maybe I'll do some more smaller products. And you can say, if you, by the monthly subscription, you'll also get this product for free. So I'm trying to build like a product suite. Um, but yeah, mainly it's about um, you get basically more value, more in-depth stuff. Plus you also get like expert advice by like leading people in the field we're in. Mm. And, and like for 20 bucks a month. That's like How, how did now. you decide that price? I looked at some other newsletters and I felt like it's like a, it's a, it's a price that feels good to me. I think it could be higher potentially. But it feels like a good starting price, 20 bucks a month. It's like, if I think it's, it's an amazing steal, to be honest. 
for yeah. 20 bucks because like the potential like outcome of if you do everything you learn for 20 bucks is crazy yeah um so talking about that it might need to be higher even <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i feel like we have to end the call with talking about ai and being a solopreneur since that's you know your area of expertise so I want to talk about being a solopreneur first because I feel like a lot of creators think that they need to hire in order to be like a legit business or in order to scale and grow their business. What do you think the benefits of being a solopreneur are? Like, and is that something that some creators should consider? I think um, you can be a solopreneur but still hire, even if that sounds not like as, uh, how do you say it, intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? So I think you can work with freelance. Like I, I work with people as well. Okay. But for me, it's like a difference to hiring like a complete team around you. But for some part, I will get like a virtual assistant or with some stuff like to build parts of the email stuff or get like someone else to help me with it. So I want to be clear about I don't do 100% on my own. And I think that's also a wrong way to look at it. But also you don't have, you don't have to be any of the extremes, I would say. And the solopreneur for me is more about like I basically have no hierarchy with anything. So I'm like the main part of every, of the whole business. But I'm also an AI and about like being more optimized and efficient. So like building processes, they can also include other people. I think that's totally fine. And I think it's like, it's not like <laughs> against the religion of solopreneurship yeah. to be like, oh, I use a freelancer <laughs> or whatever, because in the end you want to run the business like, and not let the business run you in a way. True. But I think that's very important to find ways to like keep good health, have fun while you run the business. Because in the end, if you run a business and you don't, it's not fun for you and it's just like a prison. Like it's not a business, it's just a job and you're not even self-employed in a way. You're like just employed and like by your own boss yeah. being yourself. I just say it's yeah, so weird. Yeah, it's true. And what about um, AI tools and techniques that have like helped you to grow the business and supported you with what you wanted your, you know, business to look like? Yeah. So like I mainly also in my content use ChatGPT and Claude um, as like the main LLMs. And honestly, like I use ChatGPT so much just in like regular business content, like creating my offers, giving me advice on stuff. Like I just use it <laughs> as like a coach in a way. And that's been really helpful to me, especially if you're alone, if you don't have like a sparring partner. I also talk to a lot of people. So also advice, talk to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> just every day, talk to people that are in a, in a similar situation or maybe one step ahead or maybe even some sometimes one step behind you um, because... If you're working alone, like it can be very like lonely. So I think it's so important to keep in touch with people. But that being said, ChatGPT is also amazing at doing that. So like, if you follow my newsletter, I share a lot of these like workflows that I use for everything from like creating your offer, your pricing, your social media strategy. Um, so it's an only talk. I also use this stuff. So it's mainly ChatGPT. Um, I use some like AI note taking stuff as well um, that I like a lot. Um, also for voice notes, so it's more or like transcripts. It's more like uh, stuff that's, I don't know, like little like note-taking stuff. But it's mainly ChatGPT and Claude. Also use MidJourney. It's like the classic stuff I use. I don't use anything crazy, anything fancy. And I think most people get it wrong that they have to use a thousand tools, but it's more yeah. about like just really understanding one or two. That's That's totally sufficient. No, that's great. And I like how you mentioned tools, but also like connecting with real people. Um, yeah, I think that's quite <laughs> refreshing to hear from an AI guy. So that was really nice. Um, I'm going to end with a quick fire round now. So I'm going to ask you five questions and you can just answer with the first thing that comes to mind. So first question awesome. being, what's your favorite thing about being a creator? The connection to other people, like talking to like-minded people. I love it. What's one thing that gives you the most inspiration for what you're creating? Taking a walk. Just walking and thinking, like I really create in like bursts, and I think I'm like a, I'm I'm just a creative person. I did music before, and I just like love to create stuff. And it's for me, it's like it's really about expression. It's not about I want to create just only to create like clicks or something. Like I just love yeah. creating stuff. Yeah, no, that's so nice. Uh, what's one tool that helps you as a creator? I guess ChatGPT is pretty amazing for that. Yeah. Definitely. And um, what's one thing that helps you with your creative work-life balance? I think like really kind of restricting yourself on your own social media use. That's that's helpful if it works out. I'm always trying to do that. <laughs> so like being very intentional about your time off, leaving yeah. your phone at home, stuff like that. That's what you need. Yeah, that's good advice. And what's one piece of advice that you'd give to other creators? Like, Don't be scared to reach out. Like 
basically everything in my life happened because I reached out to someone and most people want to connect. And in the end, like most people are lonely when they create on social media. So like what they mm. basically lack in general is connection. So yeah. if you don't connect with them and try to sell them your, your stuff, you can do this later, right? But like being genuinely interested in someone and searching for that connection and conversation, it's on, the only thing you need. Yeah. Oh, I think that's such a nice way to end the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming on air. I feel like this was such a great conversation. It's really, yeah, I loved it too. it's so nice to hear like, you know, how far you've come and where you plan to go and your thought process behind all of that. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun for me. You can find Ola on Twitter, LinkedIn, and his newsletter, AI Solopreneur. If you're a creator and you do sponsorships, check out Passion Fruit. We help you to streamline the entire workflow. I'll see you in the next one.